Welcome to Women's History Month at Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. We're going to be looking at some fascinating women in history, and I'm thrilled you're here to join us as we do so. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. I'm so excited to be here with a new guest, Helen Harrison, who has just published a new book. I'm so excited to hear all about it. So welcome, Helen. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you interested in history in general? and in particular in the Tudors, because I know you have a Tudor blog as well. So kind of tell us about what drew you into the Tudors. Hi, Caroline. It's great to be here. Um, I guess my interest in the Tudors started with my A-levels, um, which it was interesting, but it wasn't a topic I knew a lot about at that point. Because when I initially started studying history, it was modern world history. So it was 20th century in the wars. So the Tudors and my A-levels was completely new. And I did a module on Tudor rebellions, which kind of ties in nicely with my book. Um, Allowed me to delve back into some of that original kind of study I'd done. And then... When I was at university, I did modules on witchcraft and the Reformation, and my dissertations were on Anne Boleyn, um, okay. who I'm hoping to return to in the future. But um, even during my childhood, my parents would take me to castles and priories and lots of different ruins and stuff when we were camping. So I was around history from a very young age, really. And then when I finished university, I started my blog, Mm -hmm. um, which is largely the Tudors, but I also delve into the Wars of the Roses um, and a bit of true crime as well, which is really interesting. So, yeah, it's been a bit up and down of what I've been studying and a bit all over the place, but I always come back to the Tudors in the end. Oh, well, that's that's a really great way to describe it. And it would be very interesting. I'm going to stay tuned to see if you do return to Anne Boleyn. I feel like she's one of the ones that gets us all hooked on the Tudor. She was certainly my first, well, and current obsession. Now, (laughs) your book is specifically on rebellions. And you did mention that you took some courses on rebellions. So what made the idea of, you know, exploring the Tudor rebellions something that you wanted to take on as a book project and really get into it? Well, when I studied it at school, we looked at kind of from Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck all the way through to Essex. And I felt like I wanted to dive more into the Elizabethan ones because I knew a lot more about the earlier rebellions. So the Elizabethan ones were a bit kind of out of my comfort zone, I guess. Mm. And I just wanted to know a bit more because I think the ones under Elizabeth were quite different because there was a lot of behind the scenes plotting and spy networks and ciphers. And it was kind of the development, I guess, of the first real spy network. So I wanted to look a bit more into that, really, and kind of how things had developed across the age, knowing more about the earlier rebellions and then how the later ones had changed. Right. And that's one of the really interesting things that I especially enjoyed about your book is while you focus on Elizabeth's, you do give us that context starting from the very beginning of the dynasty. There had been rebellions to try and take the throne, and then there had been rebel in Henry the Seventh's time, and then in Henry the Eighth's and Edward's and Mary's time, rebellions more to express dissatisfaction, often tied to religion and some of the religious troubles going yes. on. And then we get to Elizabeth, where it's just this huge time of rebellions. And so 
I wanted to sort of tie an incident in Mary the First's reign, the Wyatt Rebellion. Elizabeth was sort of sort of implicated in that. She wasn't ever charged with anything and she wasn't put on trial. But the rebellion was sort of carried out in her name. And I wonder, do you how do you think that affected Elizabeth when she became queen? That she had gone through, I mean, she was put in the tower, so it was a very frightening time, I would guess, for Elizabeth. How do you think that affected her when she became queen and rebellion started against her as queen? I think Elizabeth was in quite a unique position, really, because there aren't a lot of monarchs that can say they've experienced both sides of the rebellion being essentially a rebel, though that hasn't been proven and then having to deal with rebellions against herself. So I think she was in quite a unique position. And I think having that experience made her more sympathetic towards Mary, Queen of Scots, um, because Mary was involved in the bulk of the rebellions against Elizabeth. I mean, the first rebellion against Elizabeth was within a year of Mary arriving in England, which I don't think can be ignored. It's a bit too much of a coincidence, really. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think because Elizabeth had been the heir presumptive under her sister and then Mary, Queen of Scots, saw herself in the same position under Elizabeth, I think Elizabeth could understand Mary's position in a way that no one else could. That's really interesting because it seems to me that um, the two key, I would say during the rebellions, her two key ministers were Cecil, who becomes Lord Burley, and then Francis Walsingham. And yeah. they seemed to pretty easily come to the notion that they needed to get rid of, in whatever way that had to happen, Mary, Queen of Scots. And Elizabeth is more sympathetic. Does that seem right to you? Is that the way you see it? Yes, I think Cecil and Walsingham understood, because they had a bit more distance they understood that Mary would be a constant threat to Elizabeth. And I think Elizabeth, in her way, understood that. But she also knew that Mary wasn't perhaps as involved as she could have been in the rebellions. It might have just been, you know, the rebels had approached her. There wasn't a lot of evidence that she had reciprocated that advance until we come to the likes of the Babington plot where she condemns herself in her own writing Um, and before that it was largely done through secretaries and other kind of go-betweens. Okay okay so I want to talk about the earlier plots and then of course we'll get to Babington because that's this really big you know change everything kind of plot. But you mentioned, so she comes, so Mary comes to England after having been forced to abdicate her throne in Scotland. And Elizabeth, while Mary was still in Scotland, sort of trying to hold on to her throne, Elizabeth was sympathetic toward Mary and even supportive toward Mary that her subjects should not be rising up against her. And then when that, you know, happens and her subjects do rise up against her and Mary's forced to abdicate and then flees and comes to England, it seems to me, and you mentioned it can't be a coincidence, it just seems to me it's a trigger to at least escalate the Catholic rebellions, because of course Mary is Catholic and the Catholics were looking to her. Do you think the Northern Rebellion, for example, were their leaders just sort of waiting for an excuse to rebel against Elizabeth or did Mary coming into England really serve as a catalyst for them that now we have someone else to put on the throne? Did they see her that way? Did the leaders of the Northern Rebellion see her that way? I think some form of rebellion in the North would have happened at some point in Elizabeth's reign. I think the timing was the crucial thing with Mary being in England, this Catholic figurehead, I think was crucial to when the revolt happened. Because obviously Mary had been forced to abdicate her throne in favour of her son, who was being raised as a Protestant. And the north of England was still essentially Catholic. It always had been. Mm -hmm. London had sort of embraced reform a lot more than the north. And 
with the government being based in London, it was difficult for them often to know what was happening in the north, what the feeling was. Um, so I think they had a bit more leeway in maybe getting away with having Catholic priests and Catholic services. Um, so it, the Northern Rising kind of echoes the Pilgrimage of Grace under Henry VIII in 1536, with mm -hmm. kind of large numbers marching against the monarch and seizing various different northern towns and cities like Durham, for example. Um, but I think the leaders, Northumberland and Westmoreland, we're just waiting for an excuse to rise in rebellion. And I think Mary was the catalyst for that rebellion. I feel like sometimes we forget because communication is so widespread now that, as you say, the leaders in London didn't always know exactly what was going on in the North. I mean, that was really distant in those days. Um, we can hop on a train and be there quite soon, but that was really distant in those days. So another thing that happened right around the same time, so Mary comes in 68, 1568, and then the Northern Rebellion really takes on in 1569. And I think it's really interesting because in 1570, the Pope excommunicates Elizabeth, but he doesn't just stop there. He goes on to sort of call on Catholics to rise up against her. Do you think the Pope was... Um, an important part of what follows when we come to Rodolphe and Throckmorton leading into Babington, does the Pope's call for English Catholics to rise up against the Queen really have an effect on the rebellions? I think the Redmonds and Excelsis Bull is actually really interesting, and I do delve into it in the last chapter of my book in a bit more detail, mm -hmm. but I think it definitely prompted the Rodolphi plot, which was just the following year. I don't think you can kind of argue against that, really. But the Rodolphi plot was pretty much a disaster. But Rodolphi did approach the Pope, the Spanish and the French, who all expressed an interest in getting involved, even though nothing eventually came of it. And I think the Pope's excommunication of Elizabeth did have an impact on how freely sort of rebels did gather together um, under even Throckmorton and Babington, which was over a decade later. I think it gave them the idea that their rebellion against the Queen was legal, that it had a legal basis, which I think was crucial to the way the rebels saw themselves and their actions. That's a really good way of putting it, that it gave them sort of the credibility and how they thought of a rebellion um, and made them feel like it had a legal basis. And one of the things that I think is interesting, and I'm so glad you brought up the Rodolphi plot, and so I want to follow on that a little bit, because it didn't work, you know, it was it was just such a failure, it almost is tempting to just move quickly past it and not see it as important. But it does seem to me that the fact that someone is reaching out to, as you just said, reaching out to the Pope and reaching out to Spain and reaching out to France and attempting to put together a coalition against Elizabeth. Um, how important do you think, even though it didn't work, how important do you think that attempt to, you know, gather international forces against the English queen through the Pope's excommunication was in the plots that followed on, even though they were a decade later, but they got more and more successful. So how important do you think the Rodolphi plot is as we look at the whole sort of scope of Elizabethan rebellions? I think the Rodolphi plot is pretty crucial. As you said, a lot of kind of accounts seem to skate over it and just go, oh, it kind of never came to anything right. but it did result from the pope's excommunication and it did result in the execution of the fourth duke of norfolk um which again is absolutely crucial really to elizabeth's reign it's the first time she executes one of her nobility mm -hmm. um and not only nobility but her own cousin as well of course through her mother's side Right. So 
I think that as well is crucial. But the intention of Rodolfi to unite the Pope, the French and the Spanish, I think does kind of live on in Throckmorton and Babington, who attempt to do the same thing. It's like Rodolfi almost sets kind of, we can do this. Um, and then the others follow on from his example. Right. And I'm just really glad that you take some time to look at that because I, for whatever reason, it just sort of seems to get overlooked, I guess, because it didn't work at all. But it just, it seems to me really pivotal in um, the determination, not that the Northern Rebellion wasn't determined, but just the way it was sort of organized and the determination to involve outside um, forces in this goal of overthrowing the Queen. I think it's very interesting and I think the fact that Rodolfi effectively got away scot-free, there's been questions raised over was he really a rebel or was he an agent provocateur because he did mm -hmm. end up just leaving the country and died, I believe, as a senator in Florence. So the real, I think, tragedy of that plot was the death of the Duke of Norfolk. It is really interesting, as you say, you know, as you look closely at things, the questions that are raised are sometimes even more important than uh, sort of the facts, quote, quote, of, of the plot. So speaking of that, and one of the things I, I really, really found interesting in your book was the idea of the conspirators, some of the relationships between the conspirators in the Throckmorton plot and in the Babington plot. And of course, we give these plots names um, based on maybe their most well-known leader or a key leader. But when we come to Throckmorton, that is an individual who's just really interesting in the history, his history in the Elizabethan court. So can you tell us a little bit about Throckmorton himself and then also how some of the conspirators we're planting seeds that we see come up again in Babington. So it's not really these isolated plots. There's a really fascinating through line that really comes through in your book. So can you sort of talk us through that? Yeah, it was quite interesting for me to find out how linked all the plotters were. It wasn't something that I'd realized. I'd thought of them as distinct plots. But particularly the Throckmorton and the Babington plot, there is a lot of people in both plots who are either the same or related to each other, which is quite interesting. So the Spanish ambassador was actually um, told to leave England after the Throckmorton plot, but he remained connected to the English court and he actually was heavily involved then in the Babington plot, but he was wasn't in England at the time. He was used as mm -hmm. a go-between. So that was quite an interesting link. And it's I think it's quite unusual as well for foreign ambassadors to actually be banned from the court, which was mm -hmm. something else that sort of shocked me a bit, I guess. Um, I think that Francis Throckmorton as well is quite an interesting figure because... His family did have a lot of links to the English court, people who were respected in the English court even. Um, mm -hmm. So Nicholas Throckmorton was ambassador to both France and Scotland at different times. Um, Bess Throckmorton married Walter Raleigh. So mm -hmm. he's got a lot of connections to the court, but he decides that he's going to rebel um i mean he was raised in a catholic family um mm -hmm. and he actually later on his um cousins i think second cousins maybe they were actually gunpowder plotters in 1605 as well mm -hmm. so he was actually related to um catesby which mm -hmm. I always think is quite interesting as well. It's another link between him and rebellion. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's quite interesting. And um, it's just, it's very connected. Sometimes it's difficult to sort the connections out, I think. Mm 
Um, and the Babington plot is always focused on a lot more than Throckmorton, I think, because it was the one that led to Mary, Queen of Scots' execution. So I think, like Rodolphe, Throckmorton sometimes is not forgotten about, but maybe pushed aside. I wonder, and I, I know there's really no way of, of knowing the deep thoughts of people, but it seems to me that the consistent way that Walsingham and Cecil were taking this always very seriously and looking at Mary Queen of Scots as such a serious threat, not that Elizabeth didn't realize it, but she sometimes seemed to not want to see that. But I feel like in some ways, it's the link that you're describing and that really comes through in your book in a way I hadn't really thought about it before, because it's easy to look at the dates of some of these plots and say, okay, there was this plot and then there was no plotting for a while. And then there was this plot and then there was no plotting rather than seeing it really being a through line, you know, with different people coming up and different plots emerging from this through line of resistance to Elizabeth. So you've sort of hinted at, and I want to take a look at now. So we kind of go from the Throckmorton with some of the same conspirators and some family members, conspirators showing up again. So again, we're seeing this through line. I find that so interesting in the Babington plot. And one of the things that I've read, and I, I've talked about this sometimes here in the U.S., I've given some talks about some of this time in history. And one of the things that people sometimes ask about is, the role of Walsingham. So it seems like for a while after Throckmorton, maybe or as part of Throckmorton, they really tried to isolate Mary Queen of Scots, but then she wasn't able to make the kinds of mistakes they needed her to make to really put her on trial and eliminate her. So do you think Walsingham sort of loosened up and allowed some communication so that Mary had an opportunity to take the step of condemning herself. Can you talk a little bit about how the Babington plot evolves in that way? Yeah, I think Walsingham was absolutely crucial to Mary, Queen of Scots' eventual fate, because I think without him, the plot couldn't have unfolded in the way it did to allow Mary to incriminate herself. Um, okay. I think the plot had already had its basis before Walsingham became involved, but I think Walsingham sort of put his agents into it, like Robert Poley, Gilbert Gifford, um, and sort mm -hmm. of was determined to use this existing plot against her. I don't think the plot was conceived entirely by Walsingham. I think there had to have been some kind of plot going on and he just used it. Um, but I think it's... It's an interesting one because although Anthony Babington gives his name to it, he wasn't really a, an essential part of it. I think the plot could have carried on without him there, which is quite interesting to think that a plot that's named after someone could have done without that person. Because I think the likes of John Ballard, right. the priest, was a lot more important in keeping the conspirators together and in dealing with a lot of the correspondence. Can you tell us a little bit about Ballard and the kind of com communication that was going on and some of the secret ways that people were communicating, again, reaching out to the Pope and to France and to Spain. So it was, you know, international as well as English attempts to overthrow the Queen. Yeah, I think because John Ballard was a Catholic priest, he had a lot of links on the continent, largely through France. Um, and they managed to get a lot of Mary's correspondence through that way, um, through the embassies and through Ballard's own connections. And they managed to get in touch with conspirators in France. Um, the Duke of Guise, for instance, was supposed to be involved in potentially leading some kind of an invasion. Um, mm -hmm. But what I find really interesting is how 
Mary, Queen of Scots's correspondence got in and out of Chartley Manor, where she was staying. And right. this happened through a brewer in nearby Burton who was in Walsingham's pay, but Mary thought he was in her pay. And mm -hmm. the letters were smuggled in and out through beer barrels, um, mm -hmm. being put in a waterproof pouch through the bung of the beer barrel and in and out that way. And then Gilbert Gifford was basically a runner between Chartley and Babington and his friends in London. And the other kind of, I guess, part of the correspondence is that it didn't go directly from Mary Queen of Scots to Babington and vice versa. It would go via Walsingham. And Walsingham's code breaker, Thomas Felipez, would decode the letter before it went on to its destination. So Walsingham was fully aware all throughout the plot of exactly what was being said and what was being planned. So I don't think there was ever any real danger to Elizabeth because Walsingham would have known about it. I love those details. And that's one of my favorite things, if you can have favorite things about a plot. But one of my favorite <laughs> things is that moment where to me, it really shows Walsingham and, and the full range of what he can do. So he has ties to something as ordinary as a brewer sending beer in and out, which would be happening all the time and would seem to be perfectly normal. Oh, the beer's going in and out. And yet he's managing that part of it. And he also has this extraordinary decoder decipher in Felipez, who is able to take these messages and through what is just a, an amazing way of looking at things, being able to decode Mary's messages and decipher the communication. And I read once that one of Mary's downfalls was that she relied so much on her belief that her cipher could not be broken. Her codes could not be broken no one would ever be able to figure out what she was saying except the recipient in case it happened to fall into the wrong hands, that she was too um, honest or too candid about what she said in her letters. Do you think there might be something to that idea? I do, yes. And from my research, it seems that up until she was actually on trial, she did, wasn't fully aware that Walsingham had decoded so many of her letters and that he did know exactly what she'd been writing pretty much from the beginning of the plot. And I think she didn't realise that until the trial when Walsingham presented the evidence, which mm -hmm. is, it's quite startling that she didn't realise the plot had been broken wide open, but she still couldn't believe that her correspondence had been read and that the cipher had been cracked um i believe at one point she actually um said that walsingham had written the letters himself to incriminate her she refused to believe that it could have been broken at all it's just interesting how much she relied on that and i was able to go to in i went in february of last year to the exhibition at the British Library that had some of those letters and some of the codes and the ciphers. And so I was able to see that. And it really is interesting um, how forthright she was because she really didn't think anything could be broken and didn't, as you said, didn't realize it till the end um, that Walsingham had the tools. It's quite extraordinary, the people he had on his team to break those letters to break those codes. It is. And cipher. It is. It's, it's very interesting. And I got to see that exhibition as well at the British Library. My friend really indulged me and just let me wander around. Um, <laughs> and it, it was quite amazing just to see some of the things she wrote and just to kind of see some of the things as well that she would have had around her at the time. As you say, Walsingham was monitoring everything. So it wasn't as if he was going to allow anything to come even close to harming Elizabeth. 
But if Walsingham hadn't been there and if Walsingham's agents hadn't been able to decipher, that was a serious um, political, religious plot, threat, rebellion against Elizabeth, a very politically minded thing. And one of the things, okay, so when that's over, then the Armada and all these other things happen, but at the end of Elizabeth's reign, and you point this out, this is another one I think, you know, people sort of say, and then the Babington plot was figured out and that was the end of rebellions against Elizabeth, but it wasn't because there was this fascinating and, as you point out, very different kind of rebellion, also unsuccessful, against Elizabeth um, by the Earl of Essex. And it was such a different rebellion than we've seen in other Tudor rebellions. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how and why the Essex rebellion was so different than the previous ones that we've seen, especially with Elizabeth. Yeah, the Essex Rebellion's very unique, not just among Tudor rebellions, but generally amongst, I think, rebellions um, across the centuries, just because it was very personal and selfishly motivated. There were no wider aims, religion, succession, or dealing with economic crises. Um So it was Robert Devereux who was the second Earl of Essex and he was very Mm -hmm. angry and frustrated at losing the Queen's favour. He'd had a disastrous tenure as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in the 1590s and he returned home without leave. Elizabeth had basically told him, you shouldn't have made a peace treaty with the Irish. You should have taken your men and dealt with it militarily but Essex had made a treaty and he became worried that others were speaking against him at court in his absence so Mm -hmm. he suddenly returned to England without leave and he burst into the Queen's bedchamber at Nonsuch before she was dressed before she had all the trappings of majesty which I think Elizabeth relied a lot on image and perception, particularly in her later years. And I think Mm -hmm. Essex bursting into her chamber kind of really affected Elizabeth in that someone had seen her without those trappings of majesty, one of her courtiers and one of her favourites, which I think was the beginning not the beginning of Essex's undoing, but it was a key, I think, turning point in the relationship between Elizabeth and Essex. Essex yeah. was put under house arrest. He lost his monopoly on the customs of sweet wines, which was a large part of his income. So he was effectively on the brink of bankruptcy at that point. Um, and Essex had also claimed that courtiers like Robert Cecil, who'd taken over from his father, um, mm-hmm. And Walter Raleigh wanted to kill him. Um, He was hoping that spreading rumours like this would help him gain support. Um, He managed to gather a few followers, though estimates vary on how many. 140 to 300 seems to be the general estimate. And he locked a group of privy councillors in his house, effectively took them hostage, and then effectively rampaged through London. Um, to try and see the Queen at Whitehall. He just wanted an audience. He thought if he could see the Queen, he could regain her favour and his economic privileges. He never reached the Royal Palace. There was a small scuffle. Um, It seems that Essex's page was killed, but Essex escaped unharmed. Um, He returned home where he was arrested by the privy councillors who'd been released by one of Essex's co-conspirators who got cold feet Mm -hmm. when Essex was declared a traitor. Um, Mm -hmm. And then Essex was arrested, tried and executed for treason. It's just quite an interesting rebellion because Essex didn't have a lot of support. He was relying on his own perceived popularity He thought the people would Mm -hmm. rise in his favour just because they liked him. But Mm -hmm. frankly, I think the the people of London at that point had more important things on their mind, feeding their families and keeping a roof over their heads. 
because there'd been quite a yeah. few poor harvests and things like that. And there was quite a lot of economic hardship. So I think the people kind of thought, I don't want to get involved in these noble squabbles over riches. Um, so mm -hmm. I think Essex really was doomed to failure from the beginning um, because he just couldn't seem to keep his his own folly at bay, really. Well, yes, and he expected people to rise up in support, but he certainly was not rebelling on behalf of making life better for people or, or doing anything for them. It seems to just be about himself. And that it's just really interesting. And I really appreciate the way you put it in the context that of all these rebellions, this one stands out. And, you know, I was looking specifically at Tudor times, but you're right in other times as well as being about this one person's desire to regain favor and his economic status, not to do anything for a cause that goes beyond him. Yes, it's quite interesting because rebellions, I think, across the ages tend to be focused on succession, religion, or some kind of economic or social cause. I haven't come across another one that is quite so selfishly focused as Essex's is. Now, this is quite late in Elizabeth's reign, and he's probably her last favorite if we look at it that way. Some people um, have equated sort of her, now she was getting older, not that you were supposed to ever say that, but her sort of decline in health to his execution, that that was personally very painful to her to lose this final favorite. What do you think of that? Do you think his loss was really personal to her as well? I think Essex's loss, which was only two years before Elizabeth's own death, was kind of the latest in a long line. She'd lost William Cecil, Lord Burley, who'd been with her from when she was a princess. Um, Walsingham had then gone. Um, some of her ladies, the Countess of Nottingham, was a great favourite of Elizabeth's, died not long before the Queen herself. And, mm -hmm. of course, the big one was Robert Dudley, who died just mm -hmm. after the Spanish Armada in 1588. And I think that through the loss of so many people she'd been close to for so many years, I think right. Elizabeth maybe had started to give up a little bit. She didn't want to lose so many people um, that had been so close to her. I think particularly who'd been close to her before she was queen and had mm -hmm. been through a lot of those hard times with her. I think she found that right. particularly difficult. Well, and it's easy to imagine that. She was really very alone at the end. And this new group of her counselors who come in. So Robert Cecil maybe wasn't quite William Cecil as far as she was concerned. And, and she could sense all the eyes sort of turning to who would succeed her. So um, it's it's just an interesting moment. And then to have such a personal rebellion must have, you know, felt very personal to her as well. Well, Helen, I just love the way you have taken us through and in your book, taken us as readers through these rebellions that that go throughout the Tudors and certainly throughout Elizabeth's reign and make these connections from rebellion to rebellion. The Essex is an outlier, but before that, with Rodolphe and Throckmorton, and those, uh, you know, the, the North, starting with the Northern Rebellion, the connections and sort of the through line of those rebellions in Elizabeth's reign is just such a fascinating and helpful way for us to remember how tenuous in a lot of ways her reign was, even though it ends up being the longest Tudor reign and she dies in her bed. She is not overthrown. None of the Tudors are overthrown. I mean, you could say that about Jane Grey, I guess, but, but it, it turns out to be a very successful dynasty. But as you say, along the way, there were a lot of dangers. So thank you so much for helping us see that. 
Now, what are you working on now and where can we find you? Well, I'm currently working on my second book for Pen and Sword. Um, I'm about three quarters of the way done with that. Um, How exciting. Yes, I'm looking at um, Tudor executions this time. Um, So I'm looking at executing the Tudor nobility and why in the Tudor reigns, it seems that so many nobles were accused of treason and ended up under an execution as blade. Um, so that's wow. due out in summer 2024, I believe. So you can get all, all the updates for that on my blog, which is tudorblogger.com. That is wonderful. And I, of course, will have all these links in the show notes and your social media links as well. I'm just fascinated by a look at the Tudor executions. Now I'm just, oh, I can't wait for that. As gruesome as it sounds, it's it's really important the way that the Tudor monarchs felt the need to um, execute a lot of nobility. Yes. And in and Henry VIII's case, wives. Yes. I think it's quite yeah. singular among the Tudors, which is why I was quite so interested to look at it. Um, I mean, the last Duke was executed in... 1572 which was Norfolk and then there wasn't Mm -hmm. another Duke in England until 1623 so we've got 50 years of English history without a Duke in the country. That's wonderful that really does say a lot about that dynasty so that's great Helen I'm really excited about that well Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Again, I'll have all of these um, links in the show notes, but thank you so much for spending your time with us and helping us understand the rebellions and the ways that they're connected and how much of an outlier that Essex rebellion is. It's just helped me see that in a whole (laughs) new way. So I really appreciate that. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Caroline. It's been lovely. Thank you for joining us for this episode of British History, Royals, Rebels and Romantics and a special Women's History Month. I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a rating, maybe share with a friend and think about becoming a patron. I'm so happy to have you with me shaking up history together.